well, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure to have here Dr. Wahid Bajwa from Rutgers University, the electrical engineering department at, uh, today. Uh, he'll be talking about some of his uh, uh, very interesting research. Dr. Bajwa is currently an assistant professor in the EE department at Rutgers. His uh, research interests span many uh, different areas, including harmonic analysis, machine learning, and, uh, and communications. Uh, he received sev several awards and recognitions, uh, among them uh, the career, the NSF uh, Career Award, and the Rutgers University Presidential Merit Award, uh, and uh, several others. Uh, he's uh, a, a senior member of the IEEE, uh, and he's also an associate editor of the Signal Processing Letters, and uh, he sits on many uh, different committees at, at uh, IEEE SP Society. It's a pleasure to have him here. Thank you for coming. The floor is yours. Thank you, Hamid, for inviting me, and thank you, everyone, for being here during the lunch session. Um, I, I hope uh, we'll... Uh, oh, you do it. Okay, okay. Typically, you do that after the lunch. But uh, it's good, you know, you are all awake then. Um, so let me get started um, by talking about this work, which is collaborative dictionary learning from big distributed data. If you don't know what dictionary learning is, uh, I'll try to explain that. Um, I do have to give the credit that this is really work done by my students, uh, Harun Raja and Zara Shakiri, and I'm here taking credit for them. So. Um, this is work funded by NSF and the Army Research Office. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so it's a cliche that we are in digital revolution, and the digital revolution, of course, starts with our dear and beloved Facebook, and then, you know, we have all sorts of other things, tons of social media going on. Whatever we do, we have recommendations, our buying pattern, that's being observed by everyone. We have now our fitness being tracked through various wearable devices. We have our homes being uh, uh, monitored through various kinds of sensors. And variety of different cameras are coming online. And all of that translates into basically collection of huge and huge amounts of data or big data as the uh, popular saying goes. So the, what do we exactly mean by big data? That the talk is related to that. So what we mean by big data is that actually uh, you are dealing with a problem where basically you have a lot of samples, which is this, uh, we denote the number of samples by S, and they have dimensions N, and the number of samples far, far exceed the dimensions of your data, okay? So S is the samples, S for samples, and for dimensions, and you collect that into a data matrix, which is an N by S data matrix, and so the problem becomes that you have this huge, gigantic matrix with a large number of columns. And a very important problem that arises in the context of big data is that of matrix factorization. So you are given this big data, and you want to sort of learn some summarization of this data. One example of that is, for example, principal component analysis or factor analysis or linear discriminant analysis in which you are trying to basically find out uh, maybe R components or R key directions in which your data lies, and then you can do things like dimensionality reduction or data compression and so forth. Similarly, in independent component analysis, you are trying to find out N components that completely describe your data, and dictionary learning is another kind of problem. We are basically, you are trying to learn an overcomplete dictionary, an overcomplete basis of your data that can represent your data in a sparse fashion. So the, the point being that matrix factorization, no matter what field you come from, whether you like your PCA or LDA or whether you like dictionary learning, matrix factorization in the world of big data is a very important problem. And one of the ways that you can deal with this big data matrix factorization is using all the ecosystem that uh, companies like Facebook and Google and uh, the Apache Foundation have come up with. So basically, you have things like the Apache Hadoop ecosystem under which you have all these other fancy things. For example, if you want to do machine learning, you can use Mahout and all that and MapReduce, the 
sort of now it's going out of uh, fashion. You can do all of this thing to do big data matrix factorization in a very efficient manner and basically big companies are using it all the time. So then the question is, why am I here? And the reason is that we actually are right now witnessing another trend. We are in this situation where we are not only collecting big data, but also that data is now increasingly distributed across the globe. Right? And because of various reasons, for example, if you just go through European regulation, you can't just ship this data across the regions. There is also the size of this data prevents you from uh, shipping that data across. And so the challenge then becomes, if we stay in that realm, the big theme of big data matrix factorization, the challenge is not only now how do we factorize this big data matrix, but the challenge becomes how do we factorize a big data matrix in which the data is actually distributed across geographical regions. So that's the problem we are interested in. That's what this talk is about. If we have data which is distributed across the world or whatever region you are, you can look at it from the perspective, if you like smaller Internet of Things kinds of example, you can think of it from that perspective. If you are uh, an internet company which has data centers, you can think of it from that perspective. If you have something like uh, AT&T Research, which has their call center data sets separated at different locations, you can think of it from that perspective. But the major challenge is, now that this data is distributed across the world, how do we do big data matrix factorization? So distributed big data matrix factorization. That's the goal of this problem. Okay. And of course, I don't want to give this uh, a solution to this problem in all generality. So what I am going to do is focus on this problem from the perspective of dictionary learning, which I'll explain later. So hopefully, uh, this uh, basic motivation is clear to everyone. Okay. So let's now then pose the problem in a more formal setting. Uh, so this is the setting. The idea is that we have basically N, capital N, is the number of locations or sites or nodes, whatever you want to call them. We have capital N nodes that are geographically distributed, and each one of the nodes or sites gets some samples, S1, S2, S3, and S4. Okay? If I collect all of that data together, we, we call that the global data. So that data is still a big data, matrix, uh, big data matrix that we get, except that each one of these blocks of data is located at different locations. So this red data belongs to this side. In, in here, I'm displaying hospitals. So this red data belongs to this hospital. Green data belongs to this hospital, and so forth. You have n, data, uh, you have n locations. And their connections are described through a graph which has edges. Some of these edges may not talk to each other because of either privacy reasons or they don't have individual uh, contracts signed up where they can talk to each other or whatever other reasons. So the constraints of this problem are that local data sets, first of all, each of these individual sets are huge. They are big. And the raw data cannot be shared with other locations because of the size of these data sets. The other constraint is that the interconnections don't describe a fully connected graph. Some of the, it is a connected graph, but it's not every site can talk to every other site. Okay? And then the other thing is because you don't care what your, the neighbors that you are connected to, you don't care who they are connected to. You only know about who you are going to talk to. So if I am an entity and I am talking to another organization, I don't need to know what that organization is doing with respect to their personal communication. Okay? So I know my local topology, but I don't know the global network topology. And in this problem set, the, solu the challenge is that using my only local data and communication with my neighboring sites I want to learn a dictionary which represents not only my data, but also is a good representation or is a good basis for all the global data. 
So if you are coming from machine learning background where you are more familiar with something like PCA, so effectively what I am saying is that at some level you want to do principal component analysis on the global data without exchanging the data, but at each individual local site you want to learn the principal components that describe all the global data, even though you don't have access to the global data. Okay? And as I said, we want to look at it from the perspective of dictionary learning because dictionary learning is actually a generalization of principal component analysis at some level. Okay, so if I am going to talk about dictionary learning, I need to tell you what dictionary learning is. So let me give you that uh, flavor. Now I am switching back to a centralized setting, okay, because I want to just give a sense of what dictionary learning does. So the centralized setting is I have data Y, and I want to represent this data. I want to do matrix factorization of Y into D times X, where I call this D as my dictionary. This is basically a matrix which has N, uh, which has N rows and K columns, and typically this K is much bigger than N. And this X matrix, which is called the data representation matrix, the columns of this matrix are sparse. So uh, the idea is that you're, you want to learn in an overcomplete basis that can represent your data, every sample in your data, in a sparse fashion. That's what dictionary learning is effectively. Okay? Now, <clears throat> how do you pose this problem? Uh, that you basically do the usual thing you are trying to do in any matrix factorization problem. The, the thing is you're trying to do a goodness of fit, so you try to reduce this Frobenius norm, and then based upon what problem you are doing, you put some constraint on. So in dictionary learning, it is the same thing. You are trying to minimize this error of representation, y minus dx, and the constraint in dictionary learning problem is that each of the columns of my matrix X must be sparse. So you learn this D star X star. Now that is in a centralized setting. That is in essence what dictionary learning problem can be posed as. Of course, there are solutions to how you solve the dictionary learning problem. In our problem, of course, the challenge is that this Y is distributed across N sites. Okay? So the problem then boils down to how do we solve this optimization problem when the Y matrix is distributed across different sites, such that at each individual site, I get a dictionary DI, which is close to the dictionary that you could have learned if you had access to all the data, which you don't. But you still want to go to that centralized solution without actually exchanging the data. Okay? So, if you, uh, if you are on board, the, the themes we have talked about is you want to do big data matrix factorization. We want to look at it from the perspective of distributed data and dictionary learning. And if we understand the problem, then basically what we'll see after this are the following things. We'll look at a, cent we'll look at a very particular implementation of dictionary learning, which is called KSVD. We'll look at it from the perspective of centralized solution. Then we'll look at how do you actually change that problem into a distributed setting, collaborative, we, which, uh, a collaborative dictionary learning setting, which we call cloud KSVD. And then we present analysis to ensure that indeed the solution that we are providing for cloud KSVD ensures that your solution is close to the centralized solution. And the final thing is that uh, we will talk about application of cloud KSVD for nonlinear classifier training. Uh, this is a strand of work that started in our original paper in Alert in 2013. We did a series of conference publications, and then finally the, the final journal paper appeared in January of uh, this year. Now, I do want to mention before going ahead that, of course, doing distributed processing is an old problem. Most of that problem has been looked at from the perspective of sensor networks. But in the problem of data processing, there does exist some work, for example, that focuses on things like principal component analysis, 
all of that work is focused on sensor network setting. Um, and there are actually some of that, uh, uh, Professor Karim has also actually, is, is, I think, one of those papers. And then for distributed dictionary learning, there has been some work, so this is sort of appeared around the same time that our Allerton paper appeared. These are the three major references. Now there is more work going on. But again, one of these works mostly focused on a sensor network setting where you were not actually learning the entire dictionary at each node. And these other two works, they work pretty decent, but there were no theoretical guarantees associated with it. So that's how we differentiate from the work that uh, existed in the literature prior to this. Okay, any questions up to this point? Any clarifications? Okay, so let's now move on and we want to solve this problem of uh, uh, distributed dictionary learning, but let's look at the problem of centralized dictionary learning first. So centralized dictionary learning starts with this problem formulation. Now we assume that this Y is available at a centralized location and there are many approaches that have been proposed for this, including optimization-based methods and greedy methods. We are going to focus on one of the greedy methods called KSVD because of the following reasons. First of all, KSVD is greedy and it's extremely fast. It also includes individual steps that are more amenable to distributed processing. And then it's also guaranteed to converge, although no, not, not necessarily to a global minimum under certain conditions. So we'll focus on, in centralized dictionary learning, on the KSVD algorithm. So let's look at what KSVD does. It's a very brief review. So KSVD initializes with the data matrix Y and a dictionary that you could say it randomly picks any initialization. And then it does the step what is called sparse coding. So you are, of course, trying to factorize your Y into DX, and the way it works is an iterative uh, approach where it fixes D, updates X, and then fixes X, updates D. So sparse coding is the step where it's fixing D and updating X, and the way that does is a simple, this lasso problem, where basically for each individual sample, it simply minimizes the two squared uh, subject to this sparsity constraint, and you can use many algorithms like orthogonal matching pursuit, lasso, or any of the other variants. Now, of course, th there is no novelty of KSVD in this part. Then it comes to, then it fixes X. Now it has learned X. It wants to do the dictionary update part, and that's where the key novelty of this work lies. Instead of updating the dictionary all together, what it does is actually it breaks that dictionary update into one column at a time, okay? So now within dictionary, what it does, it fixes all columns except one, updates that, then fixes all the others, updates the next one, and so forth. It does this cyclic update of the columns. And all the novelty of this work actually comes into this part, which makes it really efficient. So what it does is basically for the dictionary update stage, so let's assume that you have fixed all the columns except the kth column. What dictionary update step in KSVD does is it basically goes to the kth column that you are trying to update and it finds out all the coefficients that are related to that kth column, which tells it the samples that are using the kth column, okay? So you have a large number of samples, you have S number of samples, but for any given column, because of the sparsity, not every sample is using that kth column. So the idea in the update of the kth column is that you only want to update the, the, you only want to update the column using the samples that are actually using that column currently. That's the whole trick behind the efficiency of KSVD. So basically, it, it looked up, in this case, it found that only these two samples are involved or using the kth column. Then it reduces the problem down. It says, I can throw away all the rest of the data. I only have two samples that are using the kth column, so why should I even consider the rest of the data? It reduces this problem down to now you have a new matrix Y tilde. It fixes all the other Ds and Xs except the kth column. 
So this is what, what is called the error matrix associated with the kth column of the dictionary. And it says, I want to update my new column such that this error is minimized. Now, if you stare at that, you are trying to basically, this is a column vector, this is a row vector, right? You are trying to minimize the error between a matrix using a rank one matrix. You are trying to find the rank one matrix that is closest to your given matrix. The solution to that is, of course, your singular vector, the top singular vector of EK. Okay, so we call this the kth reduced error matrix, and the solution is simply compute the singular vector of this EK and update your atom of the dictionary using that singular vector. So that's sort of the whole trick, right? By reducing the problem down, you made it very efficient, and then you basically just do a singular vector update. So now let's move on to then the problem of distributed dictionary learning. So we have again the same problem, but now the challenge is that this data matrix Y is distributed across N sites. So it's Y1, Y2 up to Yn. Yeah. And our goal is that we want to go from this original KSVD algorithm to a version that we could implement in a distributed fashion. So again, we start with the same thing. We have input Y, but now each node has only Y1 and Y2 and so forth. All the nodes initialize at the same location with some random thing. So then the question is, how do you do distributed version of sparse coding? Now, after spending a lot of time about this, actually, we came to the conclusion that you should actually not do distributed sparse coding. What you should really do is just encode your own data locally using the dictionary you have. And forget about doing the sparse codes of other data. Because if you have sparse codes of other data, other sites, then effectively you have their data, and that's we, we wanted to avoid that to begin with, right? So we decided that in the sparse coding step, we will actually do local sparse coding step, which means that every site will encode their local data using their local dictionary. So no collaborative part right now. Okay? And then we go to the question of dictionary update. And of course, now we have to figure out how do we do this part in a collaborative fashion. Right? Even if we did that even locally, then there is no collaboration. Then we are just learning dictionary using our own step. Yes? Yes, that will come later. Okay, so just for, for the sake of, I guess, if the audience, uh, remote audience uh, didn't hear, the question was, is there any theoretical guarantee for doing this local sparse coding? And the answer was, yes, it, it is coming up later. Okay, so the way we want to do dictionary update, if you remember the centralized solution, the main challenge was that you compute this reduced error matrix, and then you do a rank one uh, approximation to that reduced error matrix. Now, the challenge in our case is that, first of all, we don't have this data available at, a, at each node. Secondly, the dictionary of each site may be perturbed from each other once you start doing these iterations, right? And thirdly, you don't, we decided not to actually compute the sparse code for other sites. So what does this reduced error matrix look like in our problem? We have to redefine the notion of reduced error matrix for the update of the kth column. We still want to do the same thing. We go to our dictionary, we fix all the columns, we want to update the kth column, but we cannot use the approach that the centralized approach did, okay? So, we need a new definition of the, this reduced error matrix on which we want to do then the rank one update, or the rank one approximation. So the way we came up with is, and I, right now I'm, I'm showing a simplified picture where I'm saying every node has, uh, I'm showing only one dictionary for actually n dictionaries, right? There are n sites, so there are n different dictionaries. They may be close to each other, but they are n dictionaries. These are the data of each site, so what happens is, once the, all the sites 
decide that they want to update the kth atom, the kth column of your dictionary, what happens is each site goes to its individual data set. And they ask, what are my samples that are using the kth atom? The next site asks the same question. The next site asks the same question. And so we still get this reduced problem, but what we'll do is our reduced error matrix now is actually made up of error matrix due to uh, site one and site one's dictionary plus error matrix due to site two and site two's dictionary and error matrix due to site three and site three's dictionary. So we still get that same setup. Our, the way we want to update the kth column is we want to find a rank one approximation to this matrix which we now call the distributed error, reduced error matrix, where the error matrix is actually made up of smaller error matrices, E1, E2, and EN, where each EI is basically the error of the local data minus the local dictionary's approximation. Okay? So now we have reduced the problem of finding the, the kth column to be rank one approximation of this matrix where this matrix is distributed, right? Because each node can compute this data individually. So the solution of that, of course, will, is still going to be the same. It is going to be rank one approximation. Still, you want singular vector of EK to be the update for your, uh, for your dictionary atom, okay? And if, you, if that's a singular vector, then you can actually, that is the same as the dominant eigenvector of the outer product of your big error matrix, EK, EK transpose, okay? So effectively, the problem then gets reduced down to the following. You are looking at the outer product of EK, which is given by this, so EK, this is EK transpose, you can write that as summation of MIs. So what, what is summation of MI? That's the outer product of each local site's error matrix. Okay, so each MI is the outer product of, of your local error matrix. So the problem then further gets reduced to, you have a problem where you have, think of N sites, each site has a big matrix, and you want to compute the top eigenvector of the sum of all those matrices, okay? Now it's not concatenation of those matrices, it's the sum of those matrices. Yes? Yes, right. Yeah, yeah, we are summing the, the covariance matrices of the reduced uh, the error matrices. Excuse me. I'm sorry to interrupt. And um, for any of the class um, participants that are asking questions, there are push-to-talk microphones that you have to press when you're in hold while you're asking your questions so all can hear. Thank you. Uh, so what I asked was uh, really what you're doing is uh, summing the covariance matrices of the residual across all sites. Yes, that's correct. Okay. So now our problem gets reduced down to this finding the top eigenvector of this special kind of matrix where the summation is divided across regions. And to solve that, what we want to use is uh, the, a distributed version of the classical method called power method for computing eigenvectors of a matrix. So let's quickly look at what is power method. Power method simply says, well, if you want to find the eigenvector of a matrix M, all you do is you initialize your eigenvector to some range, you project your, your vector onto that matrix, you normalize that and you keep on going. As, as the number of iterations of power method goes to infinity, you converge to the true eigenvector. Now our problem is that this M matrix is not really available to you. You have M1, M2, M3, M4 distributed ac across locations. So what you do is you start with the first iteration each one starts with the same, let's say, estimate of your eigenvector. The issue becomes how do you do this projection? But remember, M was summation of MIs. 
So this projection, I can write it as summation of mi qi. So this projection step gets reduced down to actually you, each node projects onto its own local covariance matrix, m1. And by doing that, they get this vector r0. And then at the end of the day, all they have to do is add these things up. That's it, right? So the problem gets reduced down to you get to a distributed version where you generate your local matrix, you project onto the local matrix, you get a vector, you add them all up. How do you add them up? Well, you use this classical approach of uh, average consensus or distributed consensus. So then the question is, what is the challenge here? I mean, this is, this is something that has been done uh, for, for quite a while. People understand that in the sensor network community. Okay, so the challenge is, first of all, remember this step is a big step in our dictionary learning algorithm. So we can't do these iterations for infinite times which means we'll stop at some finite step, which means there will be some residual error in each learning step. And so what we have to understand is what is the effect of this residual error, this perturbation that you are causing because you are stopping at a finite number of steps? Or how many steps should you take so that this thing doesn't blow up? So that's the main challenge, okay? Uh, for people who don't know what distributed consensus or averaging consensus is, let me explain that very briefly. The averaging consensus, again, it's, it's a topic that's uh, quite a few decades old. The idea there is that you want to compute the sum. Each node has some vector. You want to compute the sum of these vectors. What you do is you basically construct a matrix W that is doubly stochastic. And then at each iteration, basically, nodes look at their local neighborhood and average out the readings or the uh, data in their neighbors, which is weighted by the entries of this doubly stochastic matrix, okay? And if you do that enough, then it's guaranteed. Here are some recent papers. Of course, this, this topic goes back many, uh, many decades ago. If you do that enough, you can show that this converges to the sum, but again, we are back to the same situation, that this step is one small thing in a big picture algorithm, a big iterative algorithm. You can't do that infinite number of times, and again, we get to the same situation that if we stop this thing after a finite number of iterations, we are actually going to incur some error, and the question is, does that error impact your final performance, or does that thing blow up, okay? So let me complete the algorithmic setup, and then we'll go to the theory. So algorithmic setup, it's very similar to the centralized solution. So the cloud KSVD is the same thing as centralized KSVD in terms of the basic setup. The main difference is, okay, all the nodes have their individual data, they initialize with dictionary, then instead of doing global sparse coding, they do local sparse coding. That's easy. And then they go to the dictionary update stage. To do dictionary update, they do, again do the same thing. They go to the each column of the dictionary and they say we'll update that. But to update the kth column, what they do is they compute their own covariance of their, of their uh, error matrix. And then they, up, they find the top eigenvector of the sum of these matrices using power method. And we only restrict the number of iterations of power method to be a finite number TP. To do power method, the algorithm actually uses distrib this distributed power method, which involves within it the block of distributed consensus. And again, we restrict ourselves that we don't do these iterations more than TC number of times. So, Algorithmically, this is well defined. The main challenge that we have is that because we are doing finite number of iterations here, this is not going to be perfect. That's going to create some error here. Further, we are not even doing this infinite number of times, so this is not going to be perfect. That's going to create error here, and then this is going to create error here, and so all of this, we are doing this again and again and again. The question is, does this error blow up 
or does it not? Right? So that's the theoretical challenge. Algorithmically, I have described the collaborative dictionary learning algorithm. Okay? Any questions on the algorithmic side? Okay, so as I said, the main challenge is we want to figure out what is the effect of these perturbations, and that's what we want to look at theoretically. So to do that, we'll do it in two steps. Let's first look at this smaller piece of distributed power method, okay? We'll first argue that this thing can stay, remain stable, as long as you don't have a, lo a large number of iterations, uh, as long as you do enough iterations of distributed consensus. So the result for that is actually, we can just give it in an abstract setting. The setting is this, that you have a matrix M, which is divided across the sites, and you are interested in computing the eigen, top eigen vector of some of these MIs, and you are using that distributed power method, and the result says, that the error between the estimate, the worst error, so max over all the sites, the error between the, the eigenvector that you obtain at any individual site and the true is given by, is, it is order of these two terms. If you look at this, this error is due to finite number of consensus iterations. This is basically lambda 2 over lambda 1. It's the ratio of the second largest eigenvalue of uh, your matrix to the largest eigenvalue raised to the power TP, and this error is due to the fact that you are doing a finite number of consensus iterations. If you did not do finite number of consensus iterations, this will be zero, and you will get back to this result, which is actually a classical result in power method error, okay? And, but for that to happen, for the error to scale like this, the condition is that the number of iterations must scale like this the tau mix is related to the mixing time of the random walk that's associated with your W stochastic matrix W. Let's ignore that part for the time being. Uh, that is whatever the constant is. That depends upon the topology. But if I forget that, then what this is saying is to achieve this error, you must do the number of consensus iterations that is linear in the number of power method iterations that you want to do. If you do your consensus iterations that is linear in the number of power method iterations, then your error will not blow up. Okay? So here, here is the, uh, or it will keep on going down in this uh, geometric fashion. So here is a proof of that. Uh, we, are, we are just doing a power method result. So here is the number of power method iterations, and, here is, and there are plots for different consensus iterations. And this, uh, so in general, what you want is that the error is going down, okay? But for different number of consensus iterations, you hit a floor. You stop going down because your consensus iterations are not increasing with your power method iteration, okay? So if you want your error to, be, to keep on going down geometrically, you better make sure that your number of consensus iterations are linear with the number of power method iterations. So that's the stability of the distributed power method result. Okay. So let's now give a, uh, let's now talk about the general dictionary learning result. Well, the next major hurdle there is that we have found out that the distributed power method remains stable, but the distributed power method is just a small piece in that big iterative algorithm. So first of all, for each dictionary update, you are doing power method iterations. So adder in power method is going to cause adder in dictionary, and then when you go to next dictionary atom, it uses the previous dictionary atoms. So any errors or any divergence between different sites in different dictionary, in one atom is going to lead to errors in the other atoms, right? And on top of that, you have a total of TD dictionary iterations that you are performing. So now the, all of that error is accumulating. So the question is, and the final thing is that now you are doing sparse coding on different dictionaries. So those, your dictionaries have started to diverge. You started at the same location, but after even just the first iteration, 
your dictionaries have started to diverge right, at different nodes. And now when you do sparse coding, the question is, because you are doing local sparse coding, your sparse codes are going to diverge. So there is some perturbation in that. So you have to control all of these sources of perturbation. But the good news is that, first of all, the error in our power method, the analysis we did, the error has a geometric decay. So it's going down very fast. So it should, it should help us control that total blowing up phenomenon. And the second thing is that if we focus on a particular sparse coding approach, let's, for this analysis, let's focus on lasso. So lasso is this uh, L1 relaxation or a convex approximation of the original sparse coding problem. Well, this is a convex program, and we are saying that different dictionaries now have, uh, different sites now have dictionaries D that are diverging from each other. As long as they don't diverge from each other too much, the hope is that the sparse codes that you get would not be perturbed too much. Okay? So since LASO is a convex program, we, the hope is that the perturbation is it's, it's going to stay stable under small perturbations of your dictionary. So if you put all of these things together and you sort of put them in, in the analysis of perturbation theory and linear algebra, you shake things, then it turns out that actually you can get a result that helps you control all of these errors and you can provide what is the number of iterations for consensus, power method, and dictionaries that you need to do. Okay? So with the, not going into the details of that analysis, I'll give you the result, which is, of course, based upon some assumptions. So the first assumption is uh, that, so our result that we are going after is that you get the same, you get very close to the centralized solution. Now remember, KSVD doesn't have global convergence guarantees. So for that to happen, what we are going to say is that they both start at the same location. So let's assume that centralized, there was a centralized solution uh, or a centralized algorithm that was starting at the same location, and the distributed one was starting at the same location also. So the initialization was the same. For sparse coding, we are using lasso. This result can be extended to OMP because there is perturbation analysis for that, but we would not worry about it in this. The other assumption is that in each state, the centralized solution would actually result in unique sparse codes. Okay, so there are no multiple sparse codes that can exist. And then, of course, for power method to work, we need that there exists a spectral gap in your error matrices. So under these assumption, the result comes out which says that you reach the centralized performance. So let's parse this result a little bit more. So here is the result. The first part is that it says, so this is, this is your dictionary atom, kth atom of the centralized solution after TD iterations. And these are the kth atom of your distributed cloud KSVD at location I after TD iteration. And what it's saying is that the worst error among, over all the sites and all atoms is going to be small. So delta D is some small number. So you can indeed, if you start at the same location, you stay close to the centralized solution after TD iterations. So that's the first implication of this result. But for that to happen, you need to do a certain number of power method and a certain number of uh, consensus iterations. Otherwise, this would not happen. Okay? So for that, it says that the number of power iterations you need to do needs to be linear in the number of dictionary iterations times the number of dictionary atoms that you have. Okay? So it needs to be linear in the number of dictionary iterations times the number of atoms that you have in the dictionary. And the number of consensus iterations we already talked about, it needs to be linear in the number of power method iterations. So if you plug that in, effectively you are saying that the number of consensus iterations also needs to be linear in the number of dictionary iterations times k. But the most important part, though, is that these results, the dependence on the number of samples 
So if I increase the number of samples, the dependence is only logarithmic on the number of samples. The number of iterations that you need to do for your power method iteration, that only depends logarithmically on the number of samples. It does, of course, depend upon that, but the dependence is very weak. So let's look at uh, what kind of results that we get. Yes. Can, can you press the button? Two. So because so because the number of uh, consensus iterations is scaling linearly with the number of uh, power iterations, does that mean that the overall number of consensus operations is scaling quadratically? Because you were talking about linear number of power iterations as a function of the other stuff. Uh, no, I, I just replaced TP with this thing, right? Right, but I'm, I'm saying that, like, if, I, if I'm understanding you correctly, at the beginning you'll have a small number of uh, consensus iterations, and as we iterate, you have more and more consensus iterations. Is that correct? Oh, uh, no. So TP is the final number of iterations that you are doing. So our result, uh, you, can, you can make it work like what you are saying, which is that you actually start small and then build up, and that definitely works, but that makes the analysis a little bit tedious. So this is just, this is just a constant. When you run the algorithm, you decide that I am going to do, let's say, 100 dictionary iterations, because in my, exper in my experience, that is more than enough, and I am going to do let's say 20 power iterations, well, uh, uh, sorry, I'm going to do 100 dictionary iterations and I have 20 atoms, right? Based upon that, you figure out how many power iterations at least you need to do, and then based upon that, you need to know how many consensus iterations you need to do, and we keep that fixed, constant. We don't, we don't grow it or uh, let it scale and start small. You can do that kind of analysis where you start small as the number of iterations, as you go higher down in the iteration count, you increase your consensus iteration, but we don't do that, okay? Okay, so here is a quick analysis where we show that uh, we, we had 50,000 samples, we used uh, 15 power iterations, 15 consensus iterations in each dictionary update step. And this is the result, uh, the reconstruction error, which is the, or the representation error. What we show is, so the dotted is the cloud KSVD, the blue is the centralized solution, and the black is if I had used only my local data for dictionary learning. Okay, so we call that local KSVD. So you can see that our, in terms of representation error, our performance is very similar to the centralized case, whereas the local SVD, KSVD actually has a different uh, representation error curve. Here is another uh, plot which shows basically the, that indeed as your dictionary learning iterations goes, uh, in the beginning you are going to get this perturbation effect that we talked about, but because we are doing enough power iteration and enough consensus iterations, this thing that starts, uh, stops growing and it uh, plateaus out. Okay, so whatever delta D you are interested in, you get to that delta D. And I think uh, I am probably getting close to my time. How, how much uh, yeah, should? A couple, of couple of minutes. Okay, so I would not actually uh, go into the details of this problem, but one of the, uh, in, in the solution of this, but one of the ways is that actually the framework that we described, you could use that to actually solve a distributed classifier training problem. So the assumption now is that you have data, local, local data, and associated with that local data, you have some local, uh, local labels of the sample, and you want to actually learn a classifier that can exploit basically all this data as your training data without ever exchanging the, this training data, okay? And there is a variant of, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into that, but there's a variant of KSVD. It is called discriminative KSVD. Uh, I believe it was in Jiang et al. 10. 
and, or DKSVD, and it turns out that actually the DKSVD uh, problem gets reduced to the KSVD problem very simply, and because of the fact that the DKSVD or the, this discriminative KSVD problem gets reduced to the centralized KSVD problem, our cloud KSVD problem can be used for this distributed classifier training. So I, I won't go into the details, but here are the results. Basically, it shows that we used the MNIST data set, had 10 sites. We used first five digits and divided that data across different sites. We looked at two cases of balanced training data and unbalanced training data. And as you can see, one approach is that each site could use only its own. So this is, this is the classification error, and these are the five digits, 0, 1, 2, 3. Each site, first of all, could, in the balanced data case, every site got the same amount of data. Each site could use its own training data, and the errors are high. But if we were to use this collaborative version, then the errors are as good as, for example, something like a centralized SVM problem. And here is the, the more interesting case, which, is, which comes up all the time, which is that of unbalanced training data, which means that you have uh, samples from one class more than the samples from other class. And so in that case, if you do, of course, that mean is we are getting the same performance. But local data, these error bars means that at some sites, because of the unbalanced data, at some sites, the error is as high as 12%. Right? Because they, they are making errors in the data that they did not have access to. But by doing this collaboration, we are able to get rid of this unbalanced training data effect and get to a performance that w that's as good as centralized solution. Yes? So I see in the figure on uh, number two, uh, your cloud KSVD is better than the centralized one. Uh, yeah, so cloud KSVD is uh, yeah better than the centralized DKSVD because uh, our analysis are not for DKSVD, right? Our analysis is for KSVD, and DKSVD. I haven't gone into the details of how that was sort of built, right? But it could be that the the perturbation ended up making us a little bit better. But again, our guarantee is that you are within a ball of the, the original solution, and our, whatever solution we ended up with for classification, we ended up doing better. Okay. okay so just to conclude, uh, basically what we are talking, uh, what we talked about here is that big data is not always just only big, but it is also distributed in many problems. And matrix factorization is an important problem in that realm. So how do you do big data matrix factorization when the data is distributed? We gave a solution in the case of dictionary learning. And the whole thing and the analysis can be specialized to PCA in a straightforward manner. Because the major challenge in PCA, again, is just doing singular value decomposition. And we have given a solution for that and the power method. Uh, so. The preprints, or, or, or I guess now they are postprints and code, are available at uh, our lab website. And with that, uh, I'll thank you for listening. We have time for some uh, quick questions. Not a lot. We have time for some questions. Any questions? Uh, could you go back a few slides? I'm not sure. I guess I'll just have to tell you when to stop. Um, it's before you got to this discriminative stuff. <coughs> yeah, right? Go back. Yeah. So it appears that uh, at 11 power method iterations, you're doing worse um, in the first few, or in the middle of the uh, algorithm than with 9. Um, do you have any explanation for that behavior? Well, uh, because our consensus iterations are fixed, right? So, so when the plots that I'm showing here, my consensus iterations are not changing. If I had, so technically, if I want to go from 3 to 11, I should start increasing my consensus iterations also. But I'm not doing that. Make sense? Okay.
Yes. Sorry, yeah. You were mentioning that um, you're using a lasso type of approach uh, in the optimization. And what if you wanted to use another type of approach? So is that uh, easily changeable or is it complicated? Uh, so it, the lasso type of approach uh, in analysis, you mean, right? Yeah. So the main thing there is whatever approach you use, uh, let me go back, whatever sparse coding approach you use, the question is can you give some results on the perturbation analysis of that approach? So if I change the matrix or the dictionary that I'm using for coding a little bit, how much does my sparse code change? Uh, there is some work on OMP. As long as you can change that part, so whatever algorithm you have, if you can give a perturbation analysis of that, you can plug that into this and get a new result. So th this thing, as I showed the big picture, this thing is made up of blocks, right? The main errors are consensus causes errors in power method. Power method causes errors in dictionary atoms. We have analyzed that. Dictionary atoms cause errors in sparse coding. And that is where you can just replace a new method, give a different result. That's all. I have a very quick question. Uh, so KSVD is, uh, is, is also known uh, to screw up badly as uh, you increase the number of dimension, the underlying dimension of, uh, of your data, basically uh, the number of subspaces in the sense that uh, you have. And how does that, how does that impact your overall error when, when the KSVD itself is, right. not, is, so, not, is not converging. Yeah, th th this is a good question. And as I said, uh, our result is actually not a convergence result. Our result is how close you track the centralized result. So you are absolutely right. All I can tell you is if KSVD and we started at the same location and we did some walk and did something, we'll end up very close to each other. But if a KSVD ended up at a horrible place, then we are not going to, we can't guarantee you anything better than that. So, uh, so the underlying algorithm that you have, we are using, actually all the, all the good parts and all the bad parts we inherit. The, the, uh, the, the, I think uh, the, the ultimate question, uh, at least in my mind, is what if one could use actually the KSVD on a smaller number of sites and then increase the, si uh, the sites as you, you, you know, as you get basically progressively increase the sites. Because KSVD works well when the number of, of you know, the, the, in your case, the number of sites is small. Right. And then uh, the, the, the minute in the lingo of uh, union of subspaces, the number of subspaces that you have. Right. 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 And, and, and the underlying dimension of the subspaces right. also in, impacts the... Right. Uh, so, so the number of subspaces, of course, uh, is not necessarily a function of the number of samples, right? No, that, you, that you get to pick. That, that, that dimension is out of your hands. But yes, that, that is an interesting question to ask. We have not tried that. Uh, we are looking at another approach, which is that let's now, so uh, if, if, as you might be aware that uh, a few years ago, actually, just results on general dictionary learning were very hard to come by. Now, in the last two, three years, uh, a number of interesting results about dictionary learning convergence and those things for general problems are coming up. So another approach is, well, let's actually leave this goal of tracking an algorithm and let's give a general result about distributed dictionary learning, just like we are getting those results for centralized dictionary learning, irrespective of the algorithm. What can you say? So, so that's another approach. But for KSVD, yes, you can do some tricks to make it do and you can carry those over. We have not tried those. Well, if there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.